Guess what, guys? Bethel's home! <laughs> guys, I want to thank all of you for showing up. You guys are amazing. The energy you might take here, uh, here tonight is just out of this world. I'm not nervous, you're nervous. <laughs> guys, let's just show Bethel all the love. I can't believe that I get the privilege to speak before my biggest hero. This election is just the election of all elections, guys. This is going to be amazing. I'm going to pass the mic to V. V is going to give you a little bit of words, and then we'll get to the show.
My mom uh, got a diagnosis of cancer, very serious cancer, just a few months ago. Big surprise to all of us, big surprise to you. Um, but we've been so grateful for the support, the prayers, the push that you have been giving her to our family. My sister Charlotte, who is a nurse who's been navigating the healthcare system on behalf of my mom. And mom, just your strength and your fight and everything that you're doing right now. Um, you, you look so good to me. You are gaining weight. Um, I can tell that you've been sleeping. And, and you're here for the 28 days to make sure that we get over the line and that we actually win this one, all right? So you all with my mom on this. You're gonna win this election. You're gonna bring us through. And I love you and I'm glad that you're here. Uh, I, I gotta tell you all, we just came off the road. We have been visiting college campuses all over the state of Texas. So we were just in, maybe Muscle Meadows a week ago, in Marshall, Texas. That's as far as you can be from El Paso and still be in the same state. Um, not only is it the central standard time zone, um, it's pushing up against Arkansas. Um, it is behind the Pine Curtain. They have all these big green things they call trees, all the stuff that falls out of the sky called water. Well, you know about that recently, but um, you know, there's so much that binds us together despite the distance and the miles between us and Marshall. And in fact, some of you know this story. I know my friend Robert Gunn knows it because he helped me on a book that we wrote about this. It's a guy named Warren Stinson, who in 1910 moved from Marshall, Texas, where they have Wiley College, one of the great historically black colleges in the state of Texas. And he came to El Paso, Texas. And this black physician founds the first chapter of the NAACP in the state of Texas. And he does it right here in El Paso, a real point of pride for this community. And this guy gets as civically engaged as a human can be, especially if you're black back during the era of Jim Crow in one of the states of the former Confederacy. Never misses an election, pays his poll tax every year, and then lo and behold, in 1923, literally 99 years ago, maybe almost to the day, the state legislature passes a law that says, if you're black, you can't vote in the state of Texas. And it's not how many bubbles of soap are in this bar, or how many jelly beans in the jar, or can you recite this passage from the state constitution, literally in black and white in state statute, if you're black, you cannot participate in this democracy. And as a testament of faith in himself, and maybe in all of us, Nixon goes to fire station number five. The building is still there on Texas Avenue, not too far from downtown. That was his regular polling place. He's paid his polling tax, takes his receipt, waits to the front of the line, gets there, and the election judges who know him by sight and by name, because this guy has voted in every election, they say, Dr. Nixon, you know we can't let you vote. And Nixon says, I know you can't, but I've got to try. He takes his case to the Western District Federal Bench in El Paso. He gets shot down. He appeals all the way up to the United States Supreme Court, and he wins not one, but two incredibly important signal victories there in the highest court of land, coming all the way from right here in El Paso, Texas, in over 20 years, because that's how long it took him. He went one fight and one battle after another, doing so not just for himself or those who looked like him, but for all of us who are alive here today. By 1944, in the Smith versus Allwright decision from that court, he's been able to help integrate our elections. He sets the path for LBJ, the first Texas president to sign the Voting Rights Act into law in 1965, and he opens up the first true multiracial democracy in the United States of America's history. All of that came from El Paso. And I tell you that story right now because I think that is who we are at our absolute best. We are people from all over the state, from Marshall, from Lubbock, where I just was, from Abilene, from all over the planet, from Africa, from this hemisphere, from Europe, from Asia. But we have called this place our home. And we know that we always have to try, regardless of the odds of what they tell us we can or cannot do. And it is a reminder that the challenges in front of us, including winning this election, are not only possible, but as my friend Robert says, 
We've overcome greater challenges against longer odds before. And I'll give you one that B just told us about. In this state today, as you all are probably well aware of, no woman can make her own decisions about her own body or own health care. We have a total abortion ban. No exception for rape, and there's no exception for incest. And it begins at conception, and it takes place in a state that is at the epicenter of a maternal mortality crisis that is three times as deadly for black women. In other words, we're losing women in this state faster than almost anywhere else in the developed world. And when we foreclose an opportunity to seek a legal abortion, we're also shutting down the options for women looking for a cervical cancer screen, or to see a family planning provider, or just to see a doctor of any kind in the least insured state in America. And you may think to yourself, well, Beto, how in the world are we going to overcome that? Even if we win this election, this is Texas, it's so red, it's so Republican, it's so conservative, can this ever happen? Well, I'll tell you what, 50 years ago, abortion was just as illegal in El Paso in the state of Texas as it is today. But no one from outside came and rode to the rescue of Texas women. In fact, it was Texas women themselves who rode to the rescue of the rest of this country. Jane Roe, one of our fellow Texans, and her two Texas attorneys, Sarah Coffey and Linda Weddington. Uh, Sarah Weddington and Linda Coffey, I'm sorry. Two young Texas women, her attorneys, successfully prevailed upon an all-male United States Supreme Court to win protection for the right to privacy, to make very personal, often very painful decisions on your own without government intrusion or intervention. Roe v. Wade stood the test of time for nearly half a century before the most extreme governor in America, Greg Abbott, signed the most extreme abortion bill in this country's history. Here's my theory. If it was the women of Texas who won the way 50 years ago in Roe v. Wade, then it would be the Texas women who win it back today in 2022. <laughs> No pressure, no pressure, but we are expecting greatness from you right now at a moment that we need it more than any other. And it's what gives me so much confidence that we're going to win this election. Not only have we done these things before against greater odds and prevailed, but we're going to do them again right now, right here at this defining moment of truth. We're going to prioritize the lives of our kids out of the interests of the NRA, or the gun lobby, or Greg Abbott, or any other politician. Five of the worst mass shootings in U.S. history have taken place in this state. One of them right here in El Paso in 2019. And the only thing this governor has done is make it easier for those who shouldn't have a firearm to be able to carry them in public without a background check, without any training, without any vetting whatsoever. None of us the wiser or the safer for it. Gun violence is now the leading cause of death for children and teenagers in the state of Texas. More school shootings in Texas than any of the other 49. But that doesn't have to be our future, our fortune, or our fate. We win this election and we'll bring legislators of both parties around the table with Representative Ortega and we'll do smart, common sense, bipartisan things like raising the age of purchase from 18 to 21 for an AR-15, or a red flag law that allows us to intervene before it's too late, before someone uses that firearm to shoot somebody in a classroom. Having a universal background check, which just means that if you buy a firearm in Texas, we're going to make sure that you don't use it against yourself or against anyone else or against any child or teacher in any one of those classrooms. And speaking of classrooms, we're going to make sure that public education, and specifically these classroom educators and counselors and librarians and support staff, are fully funded to the point that they no longer have to work a second or a third job to make ends meet, that they can focus at the job at hand, unlocking a lifelong love of learning from every child in every classroom in every school in El Paso and across the state of Texas. And what so many of these educators have told me is that that classroom time and that connection they're making with that young person in front of them is so valuable, even more so after two years of a pandemic, two years of learning loss, two years where some of these kids have lost their grandparents 
to COVID, or their folks have lost their jobs, or their family has lost their house, you are telling me you're just trying to keep these kids literally alive at this moment. And you don't need a high pressure, high stakes, standardized test, eating up valuable classroom time by the weeks and months. You need that time back with those kids. So when we win, we will cancel the STAR test in the state of Texas and replace it with something that actually works, designed by educators, including some of those who are in the room with us right now. I got a chance to say hello and thank you to some of the amazing veterans outside who've served our country. Some of you may be here who've served in our tent in Utah on the post 9-11 GI Bill. You may be members of the Guard. You may be planning to enter the military before too long. I want to tell you that not only are all of us here grateful for your service, but we want to demonstrate that through our actions. We know that this country spares no expense in sending you off to war and training you and equipping you and making sure that you're ready to potentially lose your life in service to America or take the lives of someone else because we asked you to do that. Now on our end of the bargain, when you come home, somehow we lack the resources necessary to connect you with what you need to be able to get on with your life. At least that's a story I hear all too often. In this extraordinarily wealthy state, the ninth largest economy on the planet, tonight, even in El Paso, there will be veterans who have served this country, who will be sleeping on the side of the road, on park benches, underneath bridges right now. I say that we should spare no expense, pay any price, be able to shoulder any burden to make sure that every veteran has a roof over their head, have access to the care that will save their lives, and that we listen to them when they share with us what they need to make sure that they're better. For those coming back with post-traumatic stress disorder, traumatic brain injury, other signature wounds and conditions of service, they say, look, Beto, when I get into the VA, they're all too uh, ready to prescribe me an opioid to which I may become addicted. And that addiction I fear may kill me as it has done to too many of our fellow Americans. They say there's another substance that I can use that alleviates those symptoms, that increases my appetite, that restores my ability to sleep. But to use it today in Texas makes me a criminal in the eyes of the law. That's why I think when we win, we must prioritize legalizing marijuana in the state of Texas. No longer locking up our fellow Texans for possession of a substance that is legal in most of the rest of the country today. Save half a billion dollars that we're spending on incarceration and pick up another half billion on taxing the regulated controlled sale of that substance. But we have to go a step further because we know that Texans of all ethnicities and races use marijuana at roughly the same rate and I'm told that it is a lot. <laughs> but some Texans more than others are more likely to be stopped by law enforcement and frisked and found in possession and arrested and incarcerated and upon release forced to check a box on every employment application form saying that they have this conviction, making it less likely that they get the job, harder to qualify for student loans to finish your education right here at UTEP. In other words, your future and your options and your opportunities have narrowed and constrained. I want to make sure that we try to make that right. So we're also going to expunge the arrest records for anyone who served for possession of that substance. Make sure that you can get on with your life and do the right thing. And then lastly, and then we'll come back to you, lastly, um, when it comes to this democracy that Lawrence Nixon fought for, and won the right to vote for just about everybody here in this room. Nowhere is it under greater attack right now than in the state of Texas. Um, the right to vote uh, is more constrained here. The ability to get on the rolls and register yourself to vote harder here in Texas than any other state in the union. 13% of the mail-in ballots cast in March, our last election, were rejected by the state. Not 13% of voters stayed home or couldn't figure out the ballot or just decided not to show up, but 13% of those who qualified, requested it, filled it out, sent it in, had it sent back. 13 out of 100 times. One of those 
was a 95-year-old World War II veteran. In other words, this guy was someone who was willing to lose his life fighting fascism half a world away to defend democracy here at home in World War II and had his ballot uh, rejected not once but three times. And there's no one among us who's more earned the right to vote than that guy has. So, so where are we today? We're in a place where it's going to take all of us reaching out to those who are the targets of suppression and intimidation and giving them a reason to come into this election. Um, knocking on their doors, as we've been doing day in and day out. Talking to your classmates and your colleagues and your neighbors and your family members. Giving them a reason, in your own words, from your own heart, why this is the most important election of their lifetimes. And why they must participate if we're going to be able to come through at the end of the day. And when we do, we're going to make sure that this democracy really does work for each and every single one of us. We're going to work on things like automatic voter registration, so that when you turn 18, you're automatically on the rolls. Online voter registration, so if you change address, you can update that easily over the internet. We're going to replace gerrymandered districts with ones that you draw, citizen-led redistricting commissions right here in Texas. And this idea, which I like a lot, which is replacing Confederate Heroes Day as a celebrated state holiday with Election Day as a celebrated state holiday. So you can take the day off of school or from work and be able to vote and participate in this democracy. We do that. And there is no stopping us as a community, as a people, as a state in the great things that we want to be able to do. And the most important, the one right in front of us right now, is to replace Greg Abbott as a governor of Texas. Not only is it this extreme abortion ban that we described earlier, not only is it the fact that it's been 20 weeks to the day that 19 kids and their two teachers were slaughtered in their classroom in Uvalde, Texas, absolutely defenseless against somebody who could legally at the age of 18 buy not one but two AR-15s, weapons designed for war for the express purpose of killing human beings at a distance that he could buy those weapons, walk into that school at Robb Elementary, and use it against those children. That weapon designed to take an enemy soldier down at 500 yards was used against kids at 5 feet, so devastating that their parents could only identify their bodies by the shoes that their kids were wearing. Those kids were defenseless against that gunman and that firearm, but they were defenseless against this governor, who 20 weeks in after that slaughter has yet to lift a finger to make it any less likely than any other child in any other classroom, in any other community, in any other part of Texas meets the same fate as those 19 kids. But I'll tell you what, I have met those families. I've been to Uvalde now four times. I was there in Edinburgh, Texas during our debate a week ago last Friday when those families traveled by bus five hours to come to the side of that debate, though they knew full well the governor would not let them in the debate hall, even though there were a thousand empty seats there. He only allowed the moderators and the camera operators, wouldn't even allow Amy in. And look, um, she, she is a tough person, but she's not that scary to me and shouldn't be that scary to the governor. And he shouldn't be scared of those who he was sworn to serve, represent, and protect, these families. But they showed up nonetheless to make sure that none of us forget what happened to their kids and the responsibility we have to make sure that it doesn't happen to anyone else. And that five-hour drive is also important to me because that was about the distance that the governor could have driven on May 24, 2022, when those children lost their lives. He could have driven right down to Uvalde, Texas, but instead chose to go to a fundraiser in Huntsville, 300 miles in the opposite direction, and then showed up the next day and told those families in that community it could have been worse. Well, we're here to tell you it was a lot worse. But those families, their leadership, their courage, matched only by those that I have met here in El Paso after our own tragedy on the 3rd of August, 2019. That is the will, and that is the way, and that is how we are going to overcome this and get these sensible laws on the books. The grid failure that we didn't experience, but that you all saw in the rest of the state, it killed seven 
hundred of our fellow Texans have caused all of our energy and utility bills to go through the roof happened on his watch as well. And then this last thing that I want to leave you with. For a governor who has no record that he can possibly defend, I mean this exodus of teachers on his watch, um, the fact that we lead the nation in school shootings, the inflation in our property taxes, it means we now in Texas are paying higher taxes than our fellow Americans in California. It used to be the other way around. He's going to seek to distract and to deflect and to lie and even to make us afraid of one another lest we come together, defeat him, and do these big things that are ours by right. And I'll give you an example. He'll talk about immigration as the single greatest threat to this state. Make us scared of where we are right now, the border that connects us with Ciudad Juarez and Mexico. And we'll acknowledge that there are legitimate concerns and threats. There are people who will traffic illegal drugs into this country unless they are stopped, including fentanyl, which has killed so many of our fellow Texans. There are others who traffic and trade in human beings. Modern day slavery right here in Texas in 2022, and you better believe we're concerned about that and we want to stop it. But we also know this, the vast majority of those who seek to come to this country are trying to come here to do better for themselves and by extension to do better for all of us. They seek to work and earn a living for themselves and their families. They just want to join their brothers and sisters or parents and in Mexico today find a wait time that stretches 20 years long when you get in the back of the line. They are asylum seekers who know that to stay in Haiti or Honduras or Guatemala might very well mean that they or their children will lose their lives. And so they travel 2,000 miles to come right here to our front door to present themselves as refugees to a country that's comprised of refugees and asylum seekers. They are not an invasion, they're not an infestation, they're not animals as our former president described them. No, they are human beings just like all of us here. And perhaps no community better understands this because no community better lives this than ours in El Paso. And no community understands the consequences of our failure to present solutions to these opportunities than ours. That gunman who took 23 of our neighbors, our friends, and our family members on the 3rd of August 2019 was motivated by a hatred that is stoked by those in power, including the current governor, who on the eve of that attack in El Paso warned us that we must now take matters into our own hands against this invasion. He, he asked Texans to defend themselves. This is Greg Abbott in his own words. That gunman up in Allen, Texas was listening. He bought that AK-47, drove 650 miles to this community, posted online before he walked into this Walmart that he had come to repel the invasion of Hispanics who were going to take over this state and replace it. The governor is still trading in that rhetoric and that language today. We saw the, the gentleman who was killed in Hudspeth County um, just week before last by someone who thought it was okay, maybe he thought that person was an animal and could be treated in that way. Not only are we missing out on the opportunities to connect people with jobs that no one who was born in this state or country will work, or to join families that are separated by distance and a border, or to do the right thing by those asylum seekers who are simply trying to follow the law, our failure to act and to move and frankly to win this election will mean that we will see more acts of violence and hatred perpetrated against members of our community. This election could not be more important. And we can trade in this rhetoric and these stunts like busing migrants to Chicago and DC and New York with real solutions. A Texas-based guest worker program that connects those who want to come here with jobs that we have, make it safe, orderly, and legal. Lifting the visa caps for countries like Mexico or India, the Philippines, so you're no longer waiting 20 years to do the right thing, and there's no incentive to cut the line and cross in between ports of entry. And for asylum seekers, we all saw the story of those 53 human beings who died in the back of that tractor trailer in San Antonio earlier this year. We must put ourselves in their place 
and ask ourselves, what would it take to get in the back of that trailer? To climb in, you have to be assisted or lifted up or step on a stool or a block or something. It's not an easy decision. You really have to want to get back in there in the middle of the summer in Texas with no air conditioning. And then you're in, what makes you reach down and pull up your daughter, five or six years old, to join you in that container that has been sealed shut? 53 people die. You don't do it for kicks. You don't do it for fun. You don't do it to steal someone's job or take their place in our community. You don't do it to replace anybody in America. That is for sure. So what did Texas led on an asylum program that doesn't take six years to adjudicate your claim? Six years while you might wait in a refugee camp in Ciudad Juarez with your young child. But we move that down to six months or six weeks and we get that family an answer. And if they pass the bar, they are welcome to come in and yes, do better for themselves, but absolutely do better for Texas and the rest of this country. I tell those who I visit across the state, that we are one of, if not the safest cities in America, not despite the fact that we are a city of immigrants, but because we are a city of immigrants. We have a chance to lead on this issue right now, in this campaign, and after we win as governor, bringing people together to replace stunts with solutions, and lead before it's too late. <laughs> lastly, lastly, the only way we're gonna get all of these things done is if all of us choose to come together right now and do the work that will make it possible. There are a number of volunteers in yellow vests who are spread out across the room. On each of their clipboards are open shifts to go knock on doors. Behind those doors are the people who've been targeted for suppression and intimidation. They're the folks literally drawn out of this election. Let me give you some numbers and then I'll close. In 2020, Arguably the most important presidential election of our lifetimes. 194,000 El Pasoans who were eligible to vote did not cast a ballot. 194,000. Since then, 46,000 new registrants have entered the rolls. Young people who just aged in, folks who naturalized, the hundreds that Amy has registered as you walked uh, the, the blocks of this city. So add that up, um, that's almost 250,000, and by the end of the day, it will be. 250,000 people whose voices we have yet to hear, whose votes have yet to be counted. When we ran this campaign together against Ted Cruz in 2018, I lost by 216,000 votes. In other words, the ability to win this election is right here in El Paso, Texas. And if you sign up with us, if you sign up with us, won't it be some pretty profound, poetic, political justice if the very people drawn out of this democracy are brought in by us, the people of El Paso, and form the margin of victory when we win this on election night? You all with me? All right. Thank you all for coming out today. We're going to hang out for a little bit to take pictures. We're going to go outside. I'm going to let you tell us what we're about to do. Cynthia, are you ready? All right. So in order to accommodate everybody that was waiting in the hallway, we decided it's better to go outside. There's a grassy area. When you exit the front of the building to the right, we would love to do a group picture with everybody in here, everybody that's outside, and then we will stay and take pictures with everybody. So. We will wait till you walk over. Um, so please, once Benda wraps it up, then we will all walk outside. Thank you all for coming out. We really appreciate it. Thank you.